Today is September 1st, 2024. As the conflict in Ukraine continues, the very predictable result of Ukraine's incursion into Kursk, the deterioration of the rest of its fighting forces along the actual line of contact, that continues accelerating so quickly that even the Western media is now admitting this, writing extensively about this. It is unanimous by going into Kursk to humiliate the Russian government, to boost morale. Uh, not only has Ukraine accelerated the demise of its own fighting forces, its own fighting forces are now starting to realize this thus negating the morale boost that this was supposed to achieve in the first place. I will get into all of that here in just a moment. First, I want to take a look at the map. This is liveuamap.com. It is a pro-Ukrainian live map, so keep that in mind when we look at it. As you will see, Russian forces continue pushing westward along the line of contact, particularly here in the Donbas region, west of Donetsk City and Adivka. Again, remember, Adivka was the front line at the beginning of this year. Russian forces are now all the way over here, and they continue not only moving westward to Pokrovsk, uh, a very essential logistics hub for Ukraine's military. It is also the gateway toward many other major cities that Russia seeks to move toward and push Ukrainian forces out of. And so one success leads to the other on the battlefield, no matter how Ukraine attempts to dismiss the loss of each and every one of these towns and cities, their accumulated loss builds up to a huge strategic victory for Russia and severe strategic defeat for Ukraine. And the fighting continues all along the line of contact. You can see uh, these icons, these red icons with the flags. This means Russia has taken more territory. This is near Kopiansk in Kharkov. Russian forces continue to maintain their front here, north of Kharkov city. Of course, we see Ukrainian forces tied up in the Kursk region. They have not significantly expanded their hold on Kursk territory. And Russian forces, these red rifle icons indicate Russian forces are fighting back. They're moving forward and fighting Ukrainian forces back. And it is inevitable that Russia pushes these forces out of Russia. There is no timetable to do this. The longer those Ukrainian forces languish in Kursk, the easier it'll be for Russia to destroy what is left of Ukraine's military along the line of contact then they can deal with the Kursk incursion in any way they see fit. They have made peace with the humiliation and morale boost that this has created. And as I'm about to explain to you, this is already deteriorating, falling apart for the Ukrainians, according to the Western media itself. Now let's take a closer look at this salient here where Russian forces are pushing not just westward, but they're expanding the salient north and south as well. There is a timeline function here. This is showing us information as of August 31st. If we go back to August 25th, my last update, we click on here and we look, we can see that Russian forces from the 25th to the 31st, they have actually expanded this salient as well as moved it westward. And the reason they're doing this is because as they push towards Pokrovsk and the salient extends outward further and further, their flanks become vulnerable. So they need to reinforce and expand their flanks to prevent a counterattack from cutting the salient off and leaving a large amount of Russian forces encircled, isolated and encircled. I will get to that here in just a moment. So let's talk about the Western media. Let's first look at a piece I saw in the Washington Post, this one here, August 30th. What U Ukraine's Kursk incursion means for the war with Russia. Ukraine is hoping for an escape to victory. Well, that is not going to happen. That is not going to happen. And this article is talking all about what Ukraine may have hoped to achieve 
from this incursion into Kursk. And even this article itself is admitting that it is most likely not going to achieve these objectives. So let's just read through it. Uh, a, few, a few points in this piece. Kiev is hoping for an escape to victory. The audacious August 6th incursion by Ukrainian forces across the border into Russia has consolidated into what appears to be a de facto occupation. Thousands of Ukrainian troops now control hundreds of square miles of Russian territory in the Kursk region, including more than 100 Russian settlements. Again, when they say settlement, they, they mean a single road with three houses on one side and two houses on the other side. That is what they're counting as settlements in this 100 Russian settlements that they have captured. They have also captured hundreds of Russian soldiers and blown up bridges that could facilitate the movement of, Russian count, of a Russian counter-strike. Well, it also prevents the further advance of Ukrainian troops. So they're basically solidifying this as the full extent of their gains at this point. If they thought they could push further, they would have left the bridges intact. They're blowing up the bridges because they do not want Russian forces counter-attacking. The operation marks the most significant invasion of Russian territory since World War II. This is a big talking point across the Western media, and this is supposed to boost the public relations value of this incursion. Of course, public relations, morale boosts are one thing, actual strategic substance is another. And I think we will see, even at the end of this Washington Post piece, it is admitted that there is no strategic value. As a matter of fact, this is a liability, not an asset to Ukraine's ongoing fight against Russian forces. It was a surprise to both the Kremlin and the White House, this is untrue, with Ukrainian officials opting to keep Western allies in the dark till after they had deployed their forces. Categorically untrue, the CIA runs Ukrainian military intelligence. They have bases, admittedly, they have bases in the very areas the forces preparing for this incursion would have been located. They almost certain were, were not only aware of this, they were directly involved in organizing it. In remarks earlier this week, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky framed their effort as part of a larger scheme to gain leverage over the Kremlin and force a favorable conclusion to the war. Anyone even casually following this conflict will be well aware of the fact that Moscow will not negotiate with Ukraine as long as a single inch of Russian territory, pre-2014 Russian territory, is being occupied by Ukrainian forces. I think that is obvious for all to see. So how this could create leverage for Ukraine is a mystery to me. Then it admits, an end to hostilities feels rather remote. So they're saying this incursion into Kursk was meant to help Ukraine favorably end the conflict favorable for Ukraine. But then it admits an end to hostilities feels rather remote. So this is the first realistic thing that they have said so far. Even as Ukraine made inroads into Kursk, Russia turned up the heat on the main front line, pushing further into the industrial Donbas region. I predicted that this would happen. As soon as I saw Ukraine commit thousands and thousands of troops to Kursk, I knew that they did not have thousands of troops to spare and that they obviously pulled troops off the line of contact. The line of contact was already crumbling at the time. So taking thousands of your best troops and equipment off the front line was only going to make it crumble faster. It was going to accelerate the collapse of Ukraine's actual line of contact with Russian forces. Russian glide bombers are still wreaking havoc in villages and towns across Ukraine while Russian strikes are systematically targeting Ukraine's energy grid, prompting power cuts and raising fears of what's to come as the winter months approach. The incursion into Kursk has still scored Ukraine a dramatic victory. In, in what sense? Because in every other way, Ukraine is not just losing the war. Their, their loss of this war is now accelerating precisely because of the Kursk incursion. The article then starts to talk about how the incursion may possibly have diverted Russian forces. It also claims that there's some sort of relief to the glide bombs along the line of contact because Russia needs to concentrate 
uh, military aviation in Kursk, even though we have had other articles claiming that Russia is not using glide bombs in Kursk. And, and so these are a lot of things that are simply being said to try to justify the incursion, to try to make it make sense when otherwise it makes no sense. But then the article says to keep up the fight. So they're, they're trying to convince you that on one hand, Possibly Russian forces have been diverted. Military aviation is now tied up in Kursk, even though it admits that Russia has turned up the heat in, in the Donbas region, despite the Kursk incursion. So it's, it, it is a contradiction. Then it says to keep up the fight, Zelensky and his allies want Western allies to loosen rules on Ukraine using long range weaponry provided by the West, such as US provided attack rockets. To hit Russian targets deeper into Russian territory, the Kursk incursion has helped strengthen the argument for such measures. And in what way, I wonder? Given Russia's stunned, reeling response to the raid and Ukraine's desire to take more of the fight to Russian soil. But if taking the fight to Russian soil is only accelerating the loss of Ukrainian territory and the loss of Ukrainian fighting forces, how is expanding the strategy how does that benefit Ukraine? It doesn't. After Ukraine's foreign minister went to Brussels for meetings, top EU diplomat Joseph Borrell echoed the argument, the weaponry that we are providing to Ukraine has to have full use and the restrictions have to be lifted in order for the Ukrainians to be able to target the places where Russia is bombing them. Otherwise, the weaponry is useless, Borrell said. As my colleagues reported, perhaps the Western government now most reluctant, reluctant to loosen controls is the United States, with the Biden administration nurturing a long-standing wariness of taking the Kremlin up a ladder of dangerous escalation. Other analysts are more skeptical about what Ukraine will gain with added deep strike abilities. In an essay in Foreign Affairs, Stephen Beidel pointed to the limited strategic efficacy of such measures. And this is a quote from the foreign affairs piece. Russia's attacks on Ukraine's energy system, if anything, have hardened the Ukrainian will to fight, he wrote. Uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, too, strategic bombing failed to induce concessions. It took synchronized combinations of air and ground combat to secure Western war aims. Well, that much is true. Long range strikes alone are not going to win you a war. An air campaign alone is not going to win you the war. You need to use combined arms to win a war. And Ukraine has no ability to do this. They do not have the land power needed to make these long range strikes make sense. They cannot exploit anything these long range strikes achieve by then moving in on the ground. This is impossible for Ukraine. It will never be possible for Ukraine. I want to point something else out that the article doesn't mention. Russia also has long-range strike capabilities. They have vastly more missiles and rockets and drones to carry out long-range strikes with, and they have been doing this since the beginning of the special military operation. We have articles in the Western media admitting that Russia is using over 4,000 missiles every single year, and the amount of missiles and drones Russia is using is only increasing. Ukraine is geographically smaller than Russia. Its infrastructure is concentrated in a smaller amount of land, making it easier for a larger number of long-range strike weapons to destroy, to wear it down and destroy it. Russia's infrastructure and industry is spread out over a much greater area. Ukraine has many times fewer weapons to strike at it. How does anyone imagine that allowing deep strikes into Russia is going to make any difference and not simply dilute the already small number of long range strike weapons Ukraine has. If they can't even use these long range strike weapons to drive back Russian forces on the line of contact and its logistics immediately behind it, what good is diluting that firepower over a greater area? It makes absolutely no strategic sense. What it does do is raise the cost of a Russian victory. And this is all people like Joseph Burrell care about. They do not care about what happens to Ukraine. By, by encouraging Ukraine to strike deeper and deeper into Russia means giving up the fight on the front line to an even greater degree and accelerating the collapse of that front line. But by striking deeper and deeper into Russia, 
perhaps hitting industrial sites, perhaps hitting power production facilities, you raise the cost for a Russian victory. This is all about wearing Russia down as much as possible ahead of the next fight the U.S. and its allies have planned with Russia. They do not care about what happens to Ukraine. That's abundant for all to see at this point. Now, the Washington Post was talking about some sort of morale boost stemming from the incursion into Kursk. Then we have this Financial Times piece published almost the same time as the Washington Post piece. Vladimir Zelensky faces backlash over Russia's breach of eastern defenses. Strategically important Pokrovsk resistance has been weakened by demands of Kursk incursion, say critics. So here's this huge backlash. So the morale boost has now been drowned out by a massive backlash because people realize that the incursion into Kursk is now costing Ukraine the actual line of contact with Russian forces. So let's see what the Financial Times has to say about this backlash. Many Ukrainians celebrated their army's invasion of Kursk on August 6, hoping the gamble would force Moscow to divert resources to the new front and swing the momentum of the war in Ukraine's favor. This was never going to happen. Anyone with eyes could see this was not going to happen. Generals, military intelligence, everyone involved in planning had access to much more information than even we do. They should have known how unviable this whole proposition was from the very beginning. However, a breach in the front line in the strategically important Donetsk region this week has triggered a backlash against the leadership in Kiev, with critics arguing Ukraine's positions were weakened by the redeployment of thousands of battle-hardened Ukrainian troops to the Kursk operation. I warned about this as soon as the Kursk incursion began, that this was going to accelerate the collapse of Ukraine's actual line of contact. Now the Financial Times citing Ukrainians themselves, they are now admitting that this is what has happened. Russian forces are closing in on the strategically important city of Pokrovsk, taking several nearby towns this week and forcing undermanned Ukrainian units to retreat from prepared defensive positions. It's very important to understand that Ukraine moved into Kursk where there were no hardened defensive positions. There were border guards, there were military forces, uh, conscripts really in these towns, in the area, but there were no serious fortified positions across Kursk. That's what Ukraine moved into and took over. This is entirely different than Russia overtaking hardened fortifications that Ukraine has maintained for years now. Pokrovsk is one of two key rail and road junctions in the Don, Don, Donetsk region, and its loss would threaten the entire region's logistics for Ukraine's military, according to Front Intelligence Insight, a Ukrainian analytical group. Satellite imagery analyzed by open source investigators at the Finland-based Blackbird Group shows Russian forces now just eight kilometers from Pokrovsk. In response, local authorities have ordered the evacuation of residents in the area. So it's looking quite, quite bad for Pokrovsk and the Ukrainian forces around it, trying to delay uh, Russia's advances and, of course, the Ukrainian forces that are going to try to hold Pokrovsk itself. It continues. It's, uh, the article quotes Ukrainian soldiers who claim the collapse around Pokrovsk is happening faster now, faster, it's accelerating, just as I said it would. In the past three weeks, Moscow's forces have quickly captured more than 2,000 towns and villages with minimum resistance, including the long-held stronghold of New York. Rob Lee, a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, attributed the Russian gains to a shortage of experienced Ukrainian infantry and the diversion of resources to the Kursk offensive. Ukraine committed reserves to Kursk, leaving fewer options to plug gaps elsewhere. Some of the more experienced brigades have been replaced by newer, less experienced units, Lee said. The article also says soldiers who were mobilized this summer following the Ukrainian government's new conscription laws meant to fill Kiev's dwindling ranks have been sent into the fray with little training or experience, something else that I had warned about months ago, actually. When talk of Ukraine's renewed or expanded mobilization began, I said that there is no way 
for Ukraine to properly train these soldiers. It could take up to six months to do it, and they're talking about doing it in three months or less. This is not enough time to prepare troops to fight effectively along the line of contact. You send these troops to the line of contact, you're going to accelerate the collapse of your fighting capacity because they will die faster, meaning you need to find more troops send them to the front line faster which means less training for them and the process just keeps uh, accelerating each round you do of this process financial times also admits soldiers in artillery units near pokrovsk also highlighted a, a deficit in shells and a severe mismatch in firepower compared to russian forces our shells are running out we just don't have enough said an artillery commander noting that many resources had been redirected north to kursk for about the past month his unit has had one shell for every six to eight fired by the russians russian forces meanwhile maintain a significant tactical advantage bolstered by superior aviation and drone capabilities as well as in artillery this was something else that i had been talking about for months and months we continuously heard how there was a funding delay in the united states and this is what set back ukrainian forces now that the funding delay is over the flow of arms and ammunition has begun again the situation on the battlefield was supposed to tilt in ukraine's favor and yet here we have ukrainian soldiers saying they still don't have enough artillery shells and i said that this was exactly what was going to happen because even before the funding delay there were severe critical shortages that were only growing the west had stockpiles they have exhausted the west's production of arms and ammunition is not large enough month to month to replace weapons and ammunition faster than ukraine is using them and they have no real plan to expand it to make it sufficient and so this was always going to happen whether there was a funding delay or not and now we have the financial times admitting in black and white quoting ukrainian soldiers saying that they are out of artillery shells they are outgunned. They are being outfought. They are outnumbered. And by sending forces to curse, they have only accelerated the process. Now, one thing that is absolutely crucial for Russia at this juncture is to be wary of a counterattack. You have this salient that is growing further westward. Yes, they are strengthening its flanks. We have seen Ukraine move troops around. We have seen Ukraine surprise Russian forces. This is something that Russia has to be very careful about, not to overextend themselves too quickly and make their forces vulnerable to a counter attack. This is where intelligence is paramount. They need to know where Ukrainian forces are and what they are doing, what they are capable of doing, and they need to not assume that everything is working in their favor, become complacent or overconfident. With that said, where else is Western and Ukrainian propaganda crumbling? Well, it's crumbling in the area of wonder weapons. Remember how the F-16 was supposed to turn the tide against Russia? Well, the first US-made F-16 has now been lost, it is a combat loss. The pilot, uh, perhaps even more devastating for Ukraine. The pilot was also killed. This is the Wall Street Journal. Kiev recently received six of the planes to boost its fight against Russia, a symbol of U.S. support. We'll now scratch one. They have five planes and five pilots left. Let's read through it. A Ukrainian pilot was killed in combat when his F-16 jet fighter crashed just weeks after the first of the American-made aircraft arrived in Ukraine, according to U.S. and Ukrainian officials. The pilot, Oletsky Mess, died while helping to repel a massive Russian missile attack, the officials said. Initial reports indicate the jet wasn't shot down by enemy fire, U.S. officials said, but it was performing combat missions and it was lost. So it is a combat loss. Kiev hopes the advanced Western aircraft will give its forces an edge on the battlefield how is this possible the f-16 is n is not actually more advanced than any aircraft russia has in its air force and they simply do not exist in the numbers the pilots and the aircraft will never exist in numbers greater than russia's air force so how are they going to get any sort of edge on the battlefield with f-16s
They never explain. And they say they want, they want to get this edge particularly to shoot down incoming Russian missiles and help protect troops on the front lines. But the F-16s, many of which are secondhand and have decades of flying time already, are vulnerable to Russian air defense missiles and present a high value target for Moscow's forces. U.S. officials have warned about the dangers of sending pilots inexperienced on F-16s into combat. While Mess and other Ukrainian pilots now flying the F-16s are skilled in flying Soviet jets against the Russians, they went through an accelerated training course to learn to operate the American jets. And I, again, I warned that this would take years to do properly. They're trying to do it in months. If you try to do something like this in months, it is going to turn out very poorly. You are going to lose aircraft and pilots simply because they are unprepared to do these missions, simply for that fact. Added together to the other dangers that exist, even for properly trained pilots and well-performing aircraft, which they mentioned, air defenses, air-to-air -air weapons Russia has, the loss of the F-16 is the first of many to come. Many more are going to be lost for a, a wide range of reasons. This is just like the M777 artillery, uh, artillery piece, HIMARS, the Patriot, the Leopard 2, Challenger 2, and M1 Abrams main battle tanks. All of these systems the U.S. and its European allies sent to Ukraine when the first report of one of these systems being destroyed uh, was was made, people were skeptical. They said, how could this possibly be? These are wonder weapons. How could they be destroyed? But if you actually carefully analyze these weapon systems, there's nothing special about them. There's nothing that says they cannot be easily destroyed. The fact that they are not produced in large enough quantities to make any sort of strategic difference guarantees that they're going to be lost in large numbers and they are not going to turn the tide in the fighting. We have watched this unfold now for two going on to three years now. The F-16s were not going to be any different than all of these other systems that were promised to, to be game changers only to turn out as huge disappointments. So the F-16 has taken its first step on its path toward disappointing all of these people who thought it was going to turn the tide in the fighting. The Wall Street Journal also says, Zelensky announced August 4th that the first of 80 promised F-16s had arrived in Ukraine. The Ukrainian Air Force didn't provide numbers, but another U.S. official said six aircraft had arrived in Ukraine has six pilots trained to fly them. Six pilots for six aircraft. Now one pilot and one aircraft is gone, so they have five aircraft and five pilots left. This is not enough to make any, any kind of difference in any shape, form, or way. Actually, operating such a small number of F-16s is only going to make them that much more vulnerable. So even as a public relations stunt goes, this is turning out very poorly. Then I just saw this article from the BBC. So a huge humiliation to the public relations campaign. Someone has to be made to pay. Uh, President Vladimir Zelensky will not, so he simply sacks the Air Force chief following the F-16 crash. This is actually a picture of him uh, paying respects to the lost F-16 pilot. So Zelensky sacks Ukraine Air Force chief after F-16 F crash. This was uh, August 31st. The BBC says President Zelensky has sacked the commander of Ukraine's Air Force amid debate over the destruction of one of the country's valuable new F-16 fighter jets. These jets are going to be lost. One after the other after the other, they will be destroyed on the ground, they will be destroyed in the air, they will be destroyed by Russian air defenses, air-to-air -air weapons. They will also, again, just as I said, crash simply because the pilots are inexperienced and incapable of effectively fight, fi flying and fighting with these aircraft. Mr. Zelensky did not specify the reason for dismissing Lieutenant General Nikola Oletschuk, but said he had a responsibility to take care of all our warriors. It also says Mr. Zelensky has dismissed several military commanders since Russia launched its full-scale invasion in February 2022. In February this year, he sacked the commander-in-chief of the country's armed forces, Val Valery Zeluzhny, and in June, he dismissed Lieutenant General Yuri Soto after public criticism of excessive casualties and accusations of incompetence, or I should say accurate observations regarding excessive casualties and obvious incompetence. Every single aspect of this conflict fought by Ukraine against Russia 
is a result of incredible incompetence, political and military incompetence. This is a proxy war the U.S. is waging against Russia through Ukraine. Ukraine is seen as fully expendable. So everyone in Ukraine working together with the United States and the rest of NATO to continue fighting ahead in this conflict, they are doing it either knowingly, expending all of Ukraine in the process, or unknowingly. Either way, it bodes very ill for Ukraine. This is another warning to the world of what happens when the United States politically captures your country, your inability to prevent the United States from capturing your country politically will lead to your nation's destruction, exactly the way Ukraine is being destroyed day by day, day after day, week after week. We have to continue keeping an eye on this. Our ability to understand what has been done and is being done to Ukraine may help us prevent this happening again to another targeted nation or administration around the globe. We have to remember that Ukraine is not the only proxy war the U.S. is waging. It's just waging a proxy war against uh, many nations in the Middle East, using Israel as its proxy. It's also creating proxies here in the Asia-Pacific region. The administration of Taiwan, the Southeast Asian nation of the Philippines, are being fashioned into Ukraine-style proxies against China. Again, these, these proxies are meant to be fully expended fully at the expense of these proxies to raise the cost for China as high as possible. The more people who are aware of this, the more difficult it will be for the United States to politically capture and coerce these nations uh, toward their own self-destruction. So I will continue keeping an eye on all of this. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. Also in the video description are all of the links that I referenced in this video as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize any of my social media platforms. If ads pop up, feel free to skip them. If you do want to help support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also through Patreon. To everyone who has been helping out, whether it's a one-time donation, donations month to month, or if you have no extra resources and you're just helping share my work with others, getting the word out there, all of that is what makes this work possible. So thank you, as always, thank you for watching.